Cambrai 1, Overture. For a long time, I went to bed early. Sometimes when I'd put out my candle, my eyes would close so quickly I'd not even have time to say, I'm going to sleep. And a half hour later, the thought that it was time to go to sleep would awaken me. I would try to put away the book, which I imagined was still in my hand, and to blow out the light, thinking all the time while I was asleep of what I had just been reading. But my thoughts had run into a channel of their own until I myself seemed actually to become a subject of my book, a church, a quartet, the rivalry between Francois I and Charles V. This impression would persist for some moments after I was awake, but it did not disturb my mind. But it lay like scales on my eyes and prevented them from registering the fact that the candle was no longer burning. Then it would seem almost unintelligible as the thoughts of a former existence must be to a reincarnate spirit. The subject of my book would separate itself from me, leaving me free to choose whether I would form part of it or not. And at the same time, my sight would return and I would be astonished to find myself in a state of darkness, pleasant and restful enough for the eyes, and even more so perhaps for my mind, to which it appeared incomprehensible, without a cause, a matter dark indeed. I would ask myself what time it could be. I could hear the whistling of trains, which now further and now nearer punctuated the distance like the note of a bird in the forest and showed me in perspective the deserted countryside through which a traveler would be hurrying towards the nearest station. The path that he had followed being forever fixed in his memory by the general excitement due to being in a strange place of doing unusual things, to the last words of conversation, to farewells exchanged beneath an unfamiliar lamp that echoed still in his ears amid the silence of the night and the delightful prospect of being once again at home. I would lay my cheeks gently against the soft cheeks of the pillow, as plump and blooming as the cheeks of childhood or I would strike a match to look at my watch. Nearly midnight, the hour when an invalid who had been obliged to start on a journey and to sleep in a strange hotel, awakens in a moment of illness and sees with glad relief a string of daylight showing under his bedroom door. Oh, what joy, it's already morning. The servants will be about in a minute. He can ring and someone will come to look after him. The thought of being made comfortable gives him the strength to endure his pain. He's certain he heard footsteps. They come near and then die away. The ray of light beneath his door is extinguished. It is midnight. Someone has turned off the gas. The last servant has gone to bed and he must lie all night in agony with no one to bring him any help. I would go back to sleep, and often I would be awake again for short snatches only, just long enough to hear the regular just long enough to hear the regular creaking of the wainscot, or to open my eyes to settle the shifting kaleidoscope of the darkness to savor in an instantaneous flash of perception the sleep that lay heavy on the furniture, the room, the whole surroundings of which I formed but an insignificant part and whose unconsciousness I would very soon return to share. Or perhaps while I was asleep, I had returned without the least effort to an earlier stage in my life now forever outgrown, 
and had come under the thrall of one of my childish terrors, such as that old terror of my great uncle pulling my curls, which was dispelled on the day, a dawn of a new era for me, on which they were finally chopped from my head. <laughs> I had forgotten that event during my sleep. I remembered it again as soon as I had succeeded in making myself wake up to escape my great uncle's fingers. Still, as a measure of precaution, I would bury the whole of my head in the pillow before returning to the world of dreams.